Hello and welcome to our Dial Global Virtual Lounge. This is the show where we discuss the future of the modern workplace and the impact of diversity, inclusion and belonging with the world's most successful and innovative leaders. Today, I am joined by three fantastic leaders. We have Emma Vass, who is the CEO for Vasanen, Edwin Booth, the CEO and Chairman for Booths, and Ian Workman, the Managing Director for Barclays in the UK. Ian heads up the SMEs uh, within the Barclays organization. Now, today we're going to be talking very poignantly about leading in uncertain times, which is of course not only very, very applicable for the environment we're living in at the moment, what with the mass pandemic, but also I think this is something that uh, we can also hopefully learn a huge amount about because if you are listening in and you're the leader of a business or aspiring uh, leader for a future business you'll know that challenging times often come about and we often as leaders never know what we may face around the corner but one thing is for sure is people often are at the heart of that and so uh, lots of interesting questions um, have come in from our members uh, for our panelists today um, but I think first of all we'll start off with um, a couple of, of very brief introductions and also um, how each of you are frankly finding things both personally and professionally given the current circumstances. Ian I'm going to start with you because you know I like to pick on you uh, especially as your yeah. uh, advisory <laughs> thank board. You. <laughs> uh, thank you and thank you for uh, inviting me today. Look I think you know uncertainty is really strange isn't it? Um, because it can bring out a lot of different human behaviors for a lot of people it can bring out fear um and as a leader it's about helping those with the, those fear uh, and, and overcoming that but it also brings out um uh, a um uh, a creativity spirit you know there's a, there's, a, there's a famous quote which is um the future is uncertain but this uncertainty is at the very heart of human creativity and i think actually that's what i'm seeing at the moment um when you're in a crisis it's amazing how creative people can become because they're very focused on what needs to be done. Uh, and I'm seeing that uh, not just in terms of my own business, but across you know, the SMEs that we work on. Um, there's a great example of, of a social business in Scotland, for example, that um, their normal day job is a catering business. So they pl they'll provide lunches to corporates, etc. That's all died off. They've pivoted that business now to providing uh, meals for people in social need. So the homeless, uh, children on preschool meals, etc. And that's come out of a creativity spirit that they were faced with a problem, they were faced with uncertainty in their business, and actually they found a way to actually change what they're doing and possibly come up with an even better idea. And I think that's the bit about leadership in, in, in an uncertain period is helping people really dig deep, overcome their fears, and really identify what is it they're good and passionate about uh, and help them find their way and their path through all that cloud and smoke that's out there at the moment. I think it's really important. Thanks so much, Ian. Edwin, coming to you. Yeah, well, um, I, think, I think Ian's got a great point there because we have a uh, click and collect system for special items and um, we've, within a matter of four days, um, gone sort of global throughout our business with a uh, all singing, all dancing service, which launches on Monday. Um, we developed a box scheme for uh, vulnerable people um, in outlying areas in about 48 hours. Um, we've just been thrashing out some web glitches and we've got a very smooth system as of this morning. And uh, the creativity element is remarkable. We, we were in the process as we went into this of becoming a Blue Ocean company, a Blue Ocean business. And we have been able to test all the Blue Ocean principles. Um, in reaching decisions and um, running the business really in the moment. I think that is what we're learning here. And myself and my top team, Ross and Nigel, basically have allowed people to lead rather than actually communicate to them exactly what they're supposed to be doing. So we actually moderate, if you will, the conversations. And we meet virtually every single morning. Um, well, not virtually every single morning. We meet every single morning virtually <laughs> um, to actually um, deal with all the various issues, the zeitgeist, the interface with DAFRA, the interface with BHE. We're now interfacing with one of the laboratories that's looking into um, COVID testing. 
and feeding back into uh, DEFRA on that. So we are actually, we've gone up three or four gears and the pace of um, uh, the volumes going through the business is absolutely extraordinary. If I tell you that yesterday, one of the stores was 112% ahead of last year. Um, to deal with that uh, in real time is one hell of an issue for any logistics business. Um, and at the same time to deal with customer concerns and of course staff concerns as well in terms of separation. So, you know, I could talk to you for a whole hour on this, but I won't because I know that we'll have a proper conversation here. But um, the, the principles we've applied are that of allowing people to use common sense. We've legitimized common sense within the business and the framework of Blue Ocean. And um, it takes a hell of a lot of confidence and trust to deliver that into a business with even as few people as 3,000. But that is working like a dream at the moment. Wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing, mm. Edwin. And last but not, not least, how are you finding things, Emma? Yeah, I think um, probably quite similar actually to Ian and Edwin. I think um, definitely seeing the creativity coming through um, and similar to Edwin, you know, our business um, seeing incredible uplifts, um, you know, unbelievable um, peaks in demand. Um, but I think for me, the how I'm the, the word that keeps coming to me um, at the moment is actually appreciation. I think when something like this hits, um, you really start to appreciate a number of things, both from a family and a business perspective. So, you know, you I, at the moment am appreciating my husband more than I probably ever have done because I'm still working. He's, um, he's a limited company, so he's a stop now. So he's taking on... Um, when, and I just say taking on rather than embracing, he's taking on the um, homeschooling um, and the, you know, looking after the children. Um, and I have you know, huge appreciation then um, for seeing you know, what a great dad he is and the patience he has and um, you know, how he's helping us, the family, um, through this. And it is a time where you do appreciate. Um, you know, there's a silver lining on this. I'm really enjoying spending more time with the family. It's, you know, I've never, ever had breakfast, lunch and dinner with my children. Um, and still being able to work and had it for a sustained period. Um, and I'm, you know, really appreciative of that. And I think um, there are changes in the way that we are interacting and seeing loved ones. Um, you know, I've never had so many um, WhatsApp parties or um, house parties and done quizzes online. I'm in touch more now with people, uh, you know, there's the, the barriers of our family in Scotland versus our family down the road have been broken and we're seeing a lot more of our family in Scotland almost, but although it's virtual. So it's huge appreciation. I think that is going to change. Um, it's going to change the dynamics in our society going forward. And, you know, I am certainly one who has always been very office based and, you know, um, very, um, conscious now of actually you there is an alternative um, way of working and you can actually appreciate both work and family um, in balance together so appreciation there and then from a business side um you know similar to ian the, the creativity i mean my appreciation i've always loved for simon as a business but i think my appreciation for the culture and the team that I have has just notched up a whole other level as well also as our industry you know the appreciation um, of how the industry is coming together our suppliers have been absolutely fantastic the retailers are really working with us there's an appreciation on both sides that we are doing everything we can to you know to deliver in these um, incredible times these huge service and demand um, you know the, the service level that we're not 100% service level, I don't think anyone is at the moment, but to still, you know, even if you're in the 90s, or it's one of these subcategories in the 80s, it's still, you can appreciate that actually, um, that itself shows the commitment, um, creativity and proactivity of the um, everybody across the board. Um, so, I mean, I'm always someone anyway, who will always look at a glass half full, and um, I don't, you know, I don't dismiss the gravity of the situation that we're in, but I certainly appreciate um the my family and the business um, and with that appreciation comes um uh you know a renew, new desire to give back as well um so and again on a personal level as well as a business level so um i do appreciate there are other people who aren't in such a fortunate situation you know i have a garden and i have never appreciated my garden so much and it must be very very challenging 
if you're in a, a flat or an apartment with children and not able to have the outdoor spaces. Um, we love going out and clapping the NHS. Um, we have, as a business, you know, we've, um, we're allowing everybody to take time off to be NHS, um, um, to volunteer for the NHS. We are donating to Nightingale and to a number of, you know, fair share, donating to a number of charities. We've, um, you know, everybody in the business is nominating um, friends or family that work in the NHS and we're sending them um, packages and um, you know, really ramped up how we can try and support um, people in, in this challenging situation um, and appreciate that we are in a really lucky position as we're going through it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Emma. And you know what? It's been fantastic hearing from each and every one of you, not only because even though you're working in very, very different industries, albeit they are all intrinsically linked, manufacturing, retail, banking, uh, but they all serve and ultimately they are all incredibly critical industries at this point in time. And I think, um, you know, food and retail have absolutely been recognised for it. I think banking actually perhaps a little less so and they should be um, <laughs> championed for it because I think, um, you know, very big area, but all doing fantastic jobs. And um, what was really heartwarming there to hear from such fantastic leaders as yourselves is, first question I'm asking is, is, is how are you and, and how, how are the teams and how are you coping and straight away, each one of you came back with similarities in positive stories. And I think it is those positive stories and the ability to story tell and share that really binds us all together. Um, all very different people, industries and in different situations, yet we are all bound by this uh, intrinsic need to be human, to want to give and want to share. And each of you straight away there said that there were positive things and that you were hopeful for a number of different pieces, albeit, it would change the dynamic of, of society. So um, first of all, I want to commend you all massively for, for the fantastic work that you and all of your respective teams are, are doing. Um, it's great to hear, and I know our listeners will, will be most appreciative to use your terminology there, Emma, as well. And um, you know, moving on to some of the other questions that, that, that I have, actually, and some of our members also did, were we touched there on the changing dynamics of society. And certainly, I think there is a mass appreciation of the fact that things are going to be different. What they will look like, we don't know. I wondered, um, for all of you, this question, whilst we can't necessarily predict, what are our thoughts around what the the future might hold in our respective industries and or general observations because I amongst the nation I'm sure are wondering will things go back to normal or will it be a new standard of normal? Mm. So there was an interesting point there that Emma talked about when she was talking about how she's appreciating you know being at home etc uh, and I'm, I'm the same um, and I think what's, what's, what's interesting for me is that when we've looked at diversity in terms of uh, age groups, we, we've often referred to Gen Z as being the ones that won't want to do 15, 16 hour days, will want, you know, a work-life balance, etc. I think what this crisis is doing is actually showing the benefit of that to a much more wider age group. Um, you know, and if I look at my generation, for example, who were, were brought up on, you've got to work long hours to get on, actually having that balance right at the moment where I do get time to go and like last night I was walking the kids and, and playing with sticks in the string, you know, rather than being a commuter tree. I actually think there's going to be a societal shift here to show that actually, you know, there is a better balance between work and life. And, and that, that, that championing that the Gen Z have been there talking about and oldies like me have been saying, yeah, but you know, you need to work. Actually, do you know what? I think society is going to come out this better and different. Um, you know, uh, a bit like, the, you know, Emerson, I'm a glass half full type guy, you know, I think actually that's some of the positives that will come out of this. And it brings, the benefit there, it brings generations together. You know, rather than this being a young person's issue, I think the, the, the multi-generational teams can actually start appreciating the benefit. If you get that right, it benefits it all. Absolutely. Yeah, Ian, can I chip in there? I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right up to a large extent, although there will be some people um, who are in manufacturing, for example, um, yeah. in process, you know, who are not perhaps going to be able to um, you know, balance their life in the same way. We, we have a phrase here, we use the phrase work-life integration, um, largely because we think it's incumbent on us to make business life and work life really interesting and satisfying and part of your life, because you spend most of your life doing it, to derive some form of income through which to live. Um, and we're also 
and certainly at an executive level, we're encouraging people to find what we call the 40%, which is for you, for your family, um, because you know what you put into the hours, to our, in our view, is more important than the number of hours you put in. Um, and I think that's very clear in my business now, because in our central office here, we have more women than men, and it's the first time in history, really, we've had that. And we've got more women, actually, in management positions than men. Um, and, you know, they have families, they have children, they leave to have children. And someone said to me the other day, well, don't you find that a real nuisance? I said, no, I don't. Because we actually value their families and their life at home, they value their life in the business. So I think this is going to change. Um, um, a quick plug, I, I wrote a piece which went in The Guardian on um, Saturday, which really talked about how I see the future, both in terms of society and industry. And I think, you know, the definition of wealth is going to have to change. And I think placing more wealth in monetary terms in fewer hands is going to be a huge issue for mankind as a whole. And I think the, the dissemination of wealth, oblique value, is going to be absolutely vital if humankind is going to survive on this planet. Yeah, I think I'd build on that as well. I totally agree. I think the um, health is, um, again, it's a bit like the, gener the younger generation have been talking um, about health of the people and planet, but, but, you know, and really trying to, to push that agenda. And I think that is going to, to rise now. And I think... So, um, it's health, um, it's physical as well as mental health. So I think, you know, now you're starting to see this, um, you know, the impact of lockdown um, having an impact on people's mental health as much as their physical health. We're trying to protect our physical health and potentially um, jeopardizing mental health in some instances. And that mental health links to this need for work-life balance. And I think, you know, actually, as Edwin says, you know, if people are happy at work and they feel that they're integrated, their family and their work, they have a much healthier perception of work and actually they are you know, better performers and you know, it's just much more sustainable in the long term. And the other thing that really is coming out and you see people talking about a lot more is the health of the planet. And it is incredible when you look at the, um, the impact these last two months have had um, you know, the stars are brighter, there are skies appearing above cities, and in, um, in two short months, we have instantly um, stopped the destruction of the, the, the global destruction that we always said that, you know, there was no way of stopping that, and suddenly we've, like, you know, instantly given it, like, four years' worth of um, extra breathing life, and I think um, that health of people and planet is going to come much more um, on the agenda, and I think it's um, it needs to come much more on the agenda. Um, and people, you know, we need we need to protect our futures and our health. Mm. So really, I think, uh, can, I, can I chip in there? Oh um, yeah, of I course, think, of course. I, I think we've got to be careful here not to get too sort of rosy-eyed on this one, um, because if you look at the cataclysmic effect on the um, the world's P and L. Um, and the effect this will have, could have, mm. on people's pensions. Um, you know, we still have money as a means of exchange, and even though there must be a transition towards a sharing of value um, by different means, um, I think the, the effect on the world's economy and on people at base levels of that economy um, is going to be absolutely huge. Um, mm. And I like mm. I do love the fact I can see all the stars at the moment, and you know we've got deer in our garden eating the roses now. Um, they're quite enjoying them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's wildlife everywhere, which is fantastic. But I think there has to be a proper grown-up, integrated approach to how we learn from this and the good bits, and build those good bits into the way we go forward. Mm. Yeah, agree. And, and just to, and so just to build on that, Edwin, I think what's going to be interesting is human behaviour. You know. Um, because there is the positives, there's also the negatives. And we saw a little bit of that when people started to stop filing toilet rolls for no reason at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an inbuilt human characteristic. And I think what's going to be interesting to your point there around that spread of financial wealth is how do people react as they come out of this, you know, and they suddenly realise the impact on, on their, their financial situation. Um, and perhaps that gap between 
those who are wealthy and those who aren't is widened potentially during this crisis. What's the human beh behavior that drives that as well? I think it's going to be really interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. And there's some very, very important points which have been raised there. And I know a huge amount of food for thought. And I think um, following on a little from, from that theme, because clearly what we've done here is we've picked out a number of observations when it comes to prospective societal shifts, but we've also tapped into a number of different aspects of diversity, inclusion, and indeed belonging. And I think, um, you know, what is interesting is Albeit we have talked about a number of some of the classics. Oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. You completely thrown me off my train of thought then. Um, but thank you very much. Diversity, inclusion, belonging, absolutely is what it's all about. And please do read the book. Um, but, uh, but my thoughts here were, um, I think diversity is often considered to be a, a subject around, you know, gender or BAME or, or, or some of these classic visible diversities. And what you all there mentioned was actually, um, you know, a number of invisible diversities, mental health, especially being one, and also the move of social mobility which of course we'd love to be able to see up with social mobility and hopefully this will be potentially one of the trends and some of the, the barriers that are broken down during this time, um, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented time obviously that, that, that we are living in right now. Now, I wondered, whilst we can kind of, you know, talk about benefits and potential concerns forever and a day, I wondered whether there were any kind of specifics around the more holistic diversity and inclu inclusion and belonging curve that you might have all observed um, during this time specifically. So basically, um, you know, the impact um, that you have seen um, through COVID-19 on some of the factors that you already monitor or are aware of when it comes to diversity diversity and inclusion and belonging in your business. And that relates to both the visible diversities and the very, very important invisible diversities that we, um, we have all actually interestingly just touched upon there. I could, yeah, I, I'll possibly lead off on that one. Um, I think diversity in our business isn't so much about, as you say, gender, ethnicity and so on. It's also about people's um, different views on life, um, mm -hmm. whatever their creed or culture. And um, I think a situation like this forces more and more people um, to have to make decisions about dealing with a customer issue, a logistics issue, um, a sanitization issue, whatever it happens to be. And going back to this legitimization of common sense in the organization, we're allowing everybody um, to actually be themselves, to actually contribute their view and to actually, in many instances, manage their area of the business without recourse to some corporate structural, mm. um, you know, um, gatekeeping, so to speak. That's what we're going to learn from this. I think we'll come out at the other end of this, having accelerated the modernization of the way in which this enterprise works. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Edwin. And Emma or, or Ian, have you got any observations your, your, yourselves or, or anything that you wanted to mention there? Yeah, no, so, so I think um, I'm a bit of a history freak. Um, and what's been really interesting for me is, is the observation how social media have linked this crisis back to the Second World War. Mm. Uh, and I think there's an interesting observation there, because if you think back to what happened during those war periods of the First and Second World War, you know, that's when actually, um, in terms of gender equality, it really came out, you know, that actually women could do what men do. You know, men would fight and women came out and do these jobs, etc. You know, and, and, and that was a, if you look in terms of the, the, the diversity movement, you know, you had separate jets, then you had the war periods up to modern day. Uh, and I was reflecting on when Emma was talking, because you think that Emma was really well articulated there, actually, how modern families work. You know, mm -hmm. Emma's got, you know, an important job and she's doing what she needs to do to, to run that business. And it's a husband that's sort of doing the family bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a hundred years ago, that wouldn't have happened. And I think, you know, again, at the current crisis, you'll find that uh, gender, well, I'm hoping, if I'm honest, again, some of this gender uh, diverse, diversity fusion, I call it, will, will happen, where actually those stereotypical roles will go away because people realise different things that they can do and that everybody is equal. The bit that does worry me, I think, is still around some of the social um, uh, balance, you know, particularly looking at different social groups. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't got enough data points or information to sort of reflect on that one, but that's the one I probably would be more interesting to see, okay, what's happening there uh, in terms of the crisis as well. Okay, 
Excellent. And one quick question I had here before we, we move into some of the questions that we had from our members, because we had quite a lot, I actually compiled them a little bit. Um, and I am conscious of time because it is, um, for those that are listening in, it's very difficult to get senior individuals like this all available at the same time. So hurrah, we made it. Um, but uh, one thing I really wanted to ask, and uh, you know, I guess this, this is a very general question though, uh, uh, of course, and I suppose it feeds slightly off the, the piece there that we're talking about social mobility. Have we, given the fact that society is shifting a huge amount, and I think we're all aware of the fact that millennials, zillennials, and the future generations do really want to do good, they want to work for organizations that are making a difference. They're perhaps more inclined towards entrepreneurial behavior. Have there been changes perhaps around um, statistics in your, your customer bases? For example, mm. um, you know, Ian with yourself, I know that, uh, you know, obviously yeah. you specialize a lot with the SMEs. Are we seeing younger people who are wanting to take out business loans? Edwin, I know that you've talked before when we've had our, our coffee chats over, um, you know, the customer base changing. Therefore, we're wanting to represent more of the wonderful festivities and such like that are mm. having. And Emma with, with Visan and having some really fabulous ethical brands. Are you finding that there are trends in terms of youngsters really loving some of those? For example, you know, mm. I love Clipper Tea and I love what it stands. I love <laughs> like that. And you know, again, I'm an old millennial, so I'm not saying here by any stretch of <laughs> imagination that I am youthful still, but I imagine there would be hopefully positive upward trends in, in some form for each of your respective businesses. Okay. So I would challenge a little bit in terms of thinking this is a, a younger person's issue. Um, mm. I think actually what we're anecdotally seeing is uh, many more, uh, uh, probably actually over 45s that are really identifying this. And, mm. and I start to say actually, we want to have social purpose. Um, mm -hmm. For example, you know, in some of the areas like the Southwest, we've seen a huge growth in this. Um, and that's partly due to people moving to Southwest to retire, et cetera, and set up businesses. But, you know, if you look at Emma's business with the B Corp certifications and what she's doing there and that social value, I think we're seeing a lot more of that. We, we recently mm -hmm. ran a, an event where it was aimed at social businesses. That was the, that was the primary purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, out, out of the audience, or at, more than half of it were existing businesses that came to say, actually, we want to have a social purpose help us. Mm -hmm. um, and I, get, I think that's a societal... Uh, shift that we're seeing and it's great to see people like Emma's business leading that because I think that's good. I think that's a real change in the, the way the economy will go over the next 10 to 15 years. Hmm. Yeah and I, I'd agree that it's not just um, an age thing I think um, there has been this shift in, um, in society's um, you know, demand for businesses with purpose and I think yeah, the biggest impact it's had on our business is our ability to attract talent um, from all different, um, you know, from the diverse spectrum. Um, people, um, you know, want to work for a business with purpose and with substance. It's not enough now just to have a big brand name and be able to push a brand message. Um, people will actually, both employees and consumers will look for that substance behind it. People will read about your business. They'll look into what B Corp means. They'll look at what choices you've made to genuinely invest in people and development or sustainability. Um, I think people are, you know, they don't just accept that you know, it's a business and I get paid to do a good job. They want a, a lot more. And the other thing that it then means is that you know retention levels we've got you know incredible retention levels in our business because of the culture which means then um I, you know i really but also believe in this whole behavior breeds behavior so um you you create that culture and it creates itself and you know it's uh, a really it's like creating a monster but a positive monster and um, you get the right people in that are really talented and really passionate about being brilliant and doing the right thing and they will make it happen. And I guess it's a bit like Edwin saying at the moment with them, um, you know, one of the things they're seeing with them, um, as people are being more remote, you have to just empower them to, to drive the business. And I think um, that's the, the sort of biggest impact um, that a, a purpose and a culture, and definitely at the time of crisis is when a culture comes through as a shining light. Mm -hmm. Edwin, that looks very interesting. The face there that you're waving around. Go. Explain to us, explain to us what, what that is. And, and just before you do that, um, again, very interesting points there from Ian, Ian and Emma. Um, uh, and I absolutely get what you're saying there. And I, what I wasn't saying was this is necessarily an age issue, but actually with also millennials just happen to also be, um, you know, one of the largest, well, I mean, they are 
the largest generation who are in the workforce now, yet some statistics say that they are the least engaged because they're wanting to engage more so in those organizations that mean something like Emma's. Uh, what, like and that's it, when you engage them, they engage everyone else, they're the catalyst. Yeah. You know, that's where it becomes self-fulfilling. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose in relation to that, you know, I was wondering because there are, um, and whilst I appreciate completely that this is not just millennials, zillennials, the youth specifically, and that it is not that as an issue, but with them being the largest in the workforce, so to speak, mm. and with the trends going, or they have gone up, I know they've gone up and down when it comes to those who are wanting to take out business loans, which um, mm. you know, of course, but for us as a, as a growing business, you know, there's, there's pieces that we have looked at there is their kind of trends i suppose in in that area of there being um more confidence in in in, in kind of uh, you know those within that segment of the workforce wanting to actually start their own business as opposed to go to work for someone because of ethics and and, and such like um of what could be in their own business if that makes sense yeah, I mean, there's definitely, we have a whole uh, segment on millennials where we're focused on that generation um, and, and actually responding to the way uh, they want their banking services. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think it would say, and it's a very generalistic, but much more creative generation. Mm -hmm. um, and I totally agree with what Emma's saying there about you've got to engage them. If you engage them, um, they'll engage back. Uh, and that's the key. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, we're seeing a lot more in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, fintech startups in that generation yep. um, uh, and also in the creative industries. Um, and I think that there's part of me, I think, where they've seen their parents who've been on the corporate ladder and with those corporate organisations and saying actually what it means to their lifestyle and have made a very conscious life decision very early to say, mm -hmm. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be in control of my own destiny. Mm -hmm. um, and are, are looking for ways to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's a lot of our analysis around millennials, okay, is how do we tap into that and engage with them as their banker to help them with that creativity, but also their piece of that, that guiding principle, that guiding advisor to them as they go on the way. Thanks, Ian. And Edwin, I'd love you to explain because I think it's fantastic and I know you took me through a number of these values and I think actually they could be very helpful and applicable uh, to all. So I wonder, could you share a little of what was on that value sheet there before we go into individual questions from, uh, from members? And I've actually had another couple come through as we speak over LinkedIn. So let's see if we've got time to, to kind of get those in before we, uh, before we wrap up for today. Okay, I'll be very quick. Um, that is our purpose on the page that uh, I was just flagging up to you there. It's here. And um, our focus down here in the corner is people, product, and place. And people come first, just to play off what uh, Emma was saying. Um, people will drive the culture if they're allowed to, without being told what the culture actually is. And, um, you know, we have a phrase which we use, um, right people doing the right thing at the right time in the right place. Uh, it starts with the right people and people doing the right thing. And this is purported very much by one of our INEDs, um, who's uh, crossing Arizona at the moment. He was um, on video link for the board meeting last week. Um, right, guy, uh, Kevin Roberts, who you may have heard of, um, the ex Saatchi guy. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my own daughter is a good example of someone who said to me a while ago, because uh, people keep asking me, will she join the family business? Does she want to join the family business? And there was a time when she said that was the last song, thing on earth she wanted to do. Um, but a short while ago, she said, Dad, you modernize the business, I'll get the experience, and then I'll come and join you. So I thought, well, if there's ever a challenge for, for, for a dad, that's a great one. <laughs> that is wonderful. And Edwin, as a side note, I think it'd be brilliant to do a podcast with your daughter and yourself. I think that would be wonderful. For oh, she'll definitely not want to join the business if you do that. <laughs> That's too much pressure. I, I'm absolutely <laughs> sure that she will do. I'm sure that she will do. I'm sure she that might. she is very proud of, uh, very, very proud of her dad. Because I know she's been often been working for tech businesses and such like Amazon and everything, hasn't she? So I'm sure yeah. there's lots of um, brilliant glimmers of learnings that she can bring back. And, um, you know, to emulate some of the things that you've all said, it's just an absolutely fascinating time. I'm sure that we will look back at this time in 10 years and say, goodness me, can't imagine how we, we, we got through that because there's so many different things, you know, digital transformation, um, you know, at its highest and goodness knows um, an epidemic that I don't think any of us expected. Um, but thank you all for, for your contributions. And I've actually got some individual questions here for all of you. There's quite a lot. So what I've done is compile things because I'm conscious that, uh, that we are um, relatively short on time. Uh, Ian, 
because you know I love coming to you first, I've got a very specific question actually, and it's uh, it's around um, some of the uh, the coronavirus interruption loans, which actually is a a brilliant initiative. I mean, you know, like you know, I love Barclays. I am a customer, and my, a lot of my family work for Barclays, and so I'm all very excited um, when I tell them I'm speaking to you. But Barclays, um, a number of our members have said this: have introduced a coronavirus loan, which positively been received actually but um, the wonderings are how the scheme is supporting small to medium sized businesses basically and how um, can our listeners who require support basically get in touch because I know there is a lot more demand um, not only with all businesses but on phone lines and, and, and whatnot as well so I wondered whether you could just share a little bit about that. So look, I mean, we're totally focused at the moment on delivering for, for SMEs, but it is the, the demand has been phenomenal. It's a time combined with the government launching a scheme, getting it out there, and also actually developing a product. So it's been, uh, I'd say the first probably week or two was, was quite tough, just in terms of the volumes um, and trying to navigate our way through the product. The bit that I always say to all businesses, you have to remember first and foremost, this is not a grant, it is a loan. Yes, it's interest-free and fee-free for the first 12 months, but after that period, um, you are going to have to pay that money back. Okay, so um, initially we saw lots and lots of people ringing us up and inquiring for this money, but hadn't really thought about, okay, when it comes back to repaying that loan, if I'd had this loan 12 months ago when business was okay, could I have afforded it? So we're doing a lot of work to help people understand, okay, let's, it's a bit like when you're a student, let's just appreciate the debt that you're taking on, because post this crisis, this is going to move you for five or six years. And underneath that, there's the important thing is about directing SMEs to the grant funding that's available. So the government launched some grant funding through local authorities that went live uh, last Monday. Uh, and that's a really good starting point for SMEs. And I would recommend all SMEs really think about the grant funding first before they come to debt. Because grant funding, you don't have to pay it back. It's cash into your banking account. After that, if you've still then got a cash flow pro problem, which lots of businesses have when they're shut, then you need to start looking into, okay, what are the essential things I have to pay? What's the impact on my cash? Therefore, how much do I need to borrow? There's lots and lots of information out there. All the banks have got um, uh, specifics, uh, pages dedicated to support available to businesses, talking about what you can apply for. There's also the British Business Bank, uh, which we're all members of, which provides lots and lots of information, as does the business information. So I think first port of call, look at the grants, see if you're available any of that cash that's coming from the government. Uh, second point then, okay, look at the various banks. Always start with your existing bank, because all banks are tended to prioritize their existing customers just because of the volumes at the moment. So have a look at your existing bank and then think about really, am I happy that my business takes on uh, this element of debt and, and that will survive going forward? That's very help helpful. Thank you very much, Ian. And, and what I will say, and this is for everyone, I put all of the information on online afterwards. And so I'll make sure there's links to all of the respective businesses so that if not only our, our members, but, but others uh, would like to take a look because they're wanting support or, or very specific advice, obviously mm -hmm. they can do so. Um, so Edwin, I have a, a question for, for you. Or, well, I had a number of questions, but again, I want to make sure that we get um, to Emma as well because I have a number of questions also for Emma. Um, so Edwin, um, a, a number of our members have asked about, again, a, a positive initiative uh, where we see you've introduced the ability with Booz to take payment over the telephone. And of course, this is now going to allow those who are vulnerable and seeing friends, neighbours, relatives shop for them to pay for the shopping remotely, which... Uh, I think is uh, is excellent and we wondered how how that new uh, initiative was working some of our, our members also asked um, you know how how they could how they could go about that um, you know how, how kind of quickly you managed to get that in place because there are other businesses who are now trying to consider similar things with their organizations so I uh, wondered how you're getting along with that and also um, you know a, a brief summary if that's okay of, of how um, how you managed to put that into place so quickly well, it worked remarkably well, and we didn't actually, I mean, I haven't been directly involved with that, but um, Terry, our um, head of IT, and the, our customer services manager, Angela, both, they got their heads together, and um, we tried to look at the practicalities behind um, how people should um, pay for these goods, and the idea of someone bringing someone else's credit card did not appeal. And so we thought the only way of doing this was actually to do it over the phone. And in the same way that you would, for example, if you were buying 
um, a product, let's say for the sake of argument, you, you're not um, savvy on the web and you'd rather actually ring a company up and then pay over the phone. Uh, it's not dissimilar to that. Um, in um, automating that and integrating it with our web, um, we did have a, some small problems with WorldPay, uh, which we have resolved within about 24 hours. Uh, so we found our, um, our service providers incredibly supportive um, as we've tried to get this off the ground. So, um, yeah, I would say it's been a remarkable success and um, we are right up to capacity at the moment and we're now integrating um, the development of our click and collect service, which was only for premium products in this business, um, but we're now actually um, spreading that out to about 280 products and possibly more in the future and all stores going live after the test. Uh, we've had a test for two days, all stores going live next week. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edwin. That, that's great news and, and brilliantly managed to, to get that sorted so incredibly quickly. And um, finally to you, Emma, and I, uh, I've also got a question actually, which was again for Emma, but I'm going to reach out to you, everyone, because I think it'd be a really nice way to end the show. Um, but Emma, we wondered, uh, and a number of members actually ha had pointed towards, because of course you're in a... Uh, you know, in a critical sector at the moment, what with COVID-19, there are a number of questions around how you're ensuring employees within food manufacturing are staying safe and avoiding further exposure to COVID-19 and uh, the, the, the impact um, basically that has had uh, with, with you throughout the organization. And whilst you're thinking about, about that question, um, there was another question for you, or another couple of questions which were around uh, advice for female leaders actually hoping to reach CEO and director level, which I thought was very nice, wanting to know whether there's any advice that you might be able to give back. But what I thought would be quite a, a good opportunity given we have you know, all three of you here today, and you've all got remarkable careers in your very own right, whether we could actually extend that question a little bit further to everyone to say, actually, for whomever is listening in, whether you are a seasoned leader or whether you are an up and coming leader or a graduate, even just about to embark on that career, whether there is any advice that you might give to those individuals right now. Um, because I think this is a time where people are worrying about their careers and they are worrying about progression. So what could you all say, because clearly you've all made it in your careers, um, you know, that you could impart on, on others today. So Emma, coming to you with the first question around COVID-19 and manufacturing um, before we, we go into the final. Yeah, so um, we have put in place very stringent measures um, across all of our production sites. Um, and really pleased to be able to say that even uh, you know with factories in Italy, um, Spain, as well as the UK, etc., we have only got one um, confirmed case um, of COVID-19. So um, you know, very clear that people are really following these um, the guidelines. So, for example, in the factory, um, the Clipper Tea Factory in Edmundston, Dorset, um, everybody that comes in has um, an infrared temperature scan. Um, Obviously, that everyone is following the, the quarantine measures. If anybody in the family um, has even a sniffle, then um, they, they stay away from the factory. Their temperature is taken, and that's for visitors and office staff as well. Um, and then the masks, the protective gear, and the um, sanitizing hand wash. We would say in food production, they're generally, you know, you already have a very highly sanitized factory. So I think that does help in the protection of staff. Um, in the office, um, we actually had the office um, sprayed with um, a, um, a disinfectant in the last for 30 days. So even if anybody did come into the office and touch the surface, um, then um, you know the, the infection wouldn't be wouldn't be contagious um, even if they, they touched it. But our office actually, you know, um, we are everybody is in um, strongly encouraged to uh, work from home, and we've got a maximum of five people allowed in the office. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how we're protecting their physical health. And then um, actually, I, I'd say we've also done an awful lot on protecting everybody's mental health and trying to help people be engaged and motivated um, when uh, working remotely. And that's why we haven't banned the office because some people um, you know, really do want to, uh, to go to the office and find it very stressful working from home uh, with children or with IT issues and um, depending on their role. So, we haven't banned it, but we are you know, making sure that everyone um, adheres to social distancing. Um, and then we've done, um, actually before um, the government lockdown came, we um, decided to move to remote working. So 
we had the opportunity to get everybody in the office together and say, what are your concerns about that in terms of you know your your mental health and what you're finding frustrating and what can we do to overcome that? So we set up communication um, forums, um, you know whether it's via video, Skype, um, emails. So all of those were in place. We have um, we have a daily challenge. Um, I think yesterday's challenge was how many marshmallows you can um, put in your mouth while still saying happy duck clearly. Um, We've employed you know, one of our, um, our customer service manager, her husband is a personal trainer, um, so obviously doesn't have clients, so he's become the son and personal trainer. So on Zoom, we have personalized um, personal training sessions at lunchtime, which is a great opportunity for everybody to see each other. Um, we have a group WhatsApp, so all these memes and uh, funny videos going around, uh, we're sharing together. Um, it's a huge increase in terms of that interaction that we're having, um, not just uh, really trying to pick up on the, um, the coffee morning social interaction as well as the, the business interaction. Um, so, yeah, we've probably spent as much time thinking about the, the mental, um, mental health as well as the physical health, but so far, um, really pleased to say that we, have, um, we haven't been impacted at the moment. Um, by the outbreak in terms of the health of our employees, which I'm really, really pleased about. Excellent. And would you mind a, a, a quick last piece there before we come to Edwin and Ian finally and summarise the advice that you might give to, it was a couple of individuals had asked actually around it was gender equality and female leadership who are wanting to be directors and senior leaders in the future and wondering whether there's any advice that you could impart before we come to the guys. Sure. The, the challenge is whenever I'm asked that question, you end up going into huge generalizations around what female types are or male types, um, which is a trap in itself. So that's the mm. first trap to not fall into is the huge um, trap of generalization. Mm. Um, but if I pull on my experience, I'd say um, you know, my biggest learnings are um, females do have a tendency to not be as confident or um, you know, not promote themselves as much. So really hone into that confidence and be confident um, in yourself. Um, and really trust your, your intuition. So, um, you know, it took me a long time, um, many times where I intuitively thought something, um, didn't necessarily push it through, and then, you know, you, you see the reality come through. Now, I really trust my intuition, um, and no, you know, no one's right 100% of the time, um, so you can, you can go with it, and be you know, confident leaders that have strong intuition that they follow through on, I think, are generally very successful. Thank you, Emma. Edwin. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really pleased that you've said that, Emma, actually, about to the fact that, you know, you shouldn't fall into the trap of uh, stereotyping, you know, men and women, because, um, you know, there are all sorts of different sides to our characters, um, depending on our, our particular makeup. And one of the things that I put into my personal purpose, I've just flashed it up on my screen here, um, which has carried me through as a leader, is quite simply listen, assimilate, communicate, deliver, and then listen again. And the listening bit, I think sometimes in a week, it can be 80% of what you do. And from that, you use your intuition to, to provide the leadership that's required. Data, statistics are all supporting acts. At the end of the day, it's what you feel, um, both about the organization or the challenge and about your ability um, as an individual, your, your self-confidence, if you will. And, and that can be built up through, basically, I think, throughout your early years, understanding that you'll make a lot of mistakes and hopefully have peers that will allow you to make mistakes and be encouraging um, to, for you to try something again. Uh, so circumstance sometimes leads towards career progression. Um, but I think as an individual, when you're young, um, and I hope the young people in this business, if, you, if you're given um, an opportunity then that really, really helps. And I think it's incumbent on us oldies, to use Ian's phrase, um, to actually allow people to take risks and make mistakes. And that's exactly what we do in this business. And hey ho, it's starting to perform so much better than it did three years ago. Edwin, <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you very much. I, I, I always know that we can we can count on you to talk about the the people um, being actually more important than the process, which is uh, you know every single time I meet you, you're talking about the people and have these wonderful stories with a glint in your eye. And so, uh, so thank you very much for sharing that. And finally, Ian. Yeah, and look, I really resonate with what was said there, particularly when you know Edwin was talking about actually we shouldn't just talk about men or women. We've done a lot of work in terms of gender intelligence and, and talking about actually. 
uh, some females will have some male traits, some males have female traits, and actually that blending and more understanding. But look, to keep it keep it short, what I say to all the uh, the colleagues that I mentor and I talk about in diversity, there's two things that everybody needs to help them in their career. Uh, one is a sponsor, one is a mentor. A sponsor that's somebody that talks about you when you're not there, a mentor that guides you on that journey. And so for anybody looking to progress their career, get into senior leadership, if you haven't got those two things, go and get them. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic advice. And I love that you've segregated those two pieces because there's a very big difference between sponsorship and mentorship. And I do think sometimes people don't see that there is a massive difference, but there really, really is. And uh, I mean, it's, this is a proven fact. And again, I know we're trying not to segregate too much here between men and, and women, but there is um, statistics that do say um, women have got more mentors than they have sponsors, interestingly, um, females. So perhaps one of the reasons why there aren't maybe um, more women in, in, in senior positions. But, um, you know, absolutely agree with you. You know, this is about the, uh, about the person. And I think many, many individuals identify with many different things these days. And so it is important that we don't fall into this trap, as you've all pointed out, of kind of stereotyping. But very, very key piece there, Ian, from mentorship and sponsorship. They are different and definitely we should be looking at both. Um, so, so finally, I, you know, I want to thank you all immensely for your time here because I know how busy you are and I know how much of a critical time this is for all of you. So really appreciate you all being here today. I think there's been some really fantastic glimmers of, of wisdom and, and many kind of nuggets of learning that I think not only our members, but wider businesses and society can certainly take away and very very quickly i've written down a couple because i know that we all have things to go to at, at midday um, but i think what, what what really resonated with me personally was the sheer amount of heart that came out from all of you when it came to your leadership your stories and certainly this critical time which i think sometimes does bring out the absolute best in individuals um, and businesses alike. But the social purpose and the ethos that you all have, I think is incredibly remarkable. The fact that you're all doing great things and had no hesitation whatsoever when it came to talking about the good things and the silver lining of the cloud. And I think for everyone who is listening, making sure that you do try and follow in the footsteps of these three great leaders and actually try and be glass half full. There's so many um, you know, terrible and worrying things that are happening right now. And so the importance is really to stick together. Um, you know, and you mentioned you know having that, uh, that 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 gratitude and appreciation and i think you know we certainly all do have that now in abundance whether it be for our families whether it be for um you know our loved ones or whether it be for actually being able to communicate with others within the organization that we perhaps haven't, haven't managed to speak to so much so what i'd say to people as, as just kind of a final note is is really do um, pay attention to to the people and use this time to reach out to others that you might not have been speaking to quite as much, whether it is that you're in a global organization. I've heard stories of people reaching out to the other ends of the world and having conversations about mental health through to speaking to individuals um, from our own families that we just really have not had time to uh, speak to. So they might be only in the next town. So let's use this time to be able to really um, try and build those bonds and, and focus kind of on, on humanity. Um, you know, and, and, and finally, finally um you know listen and listen and listen again i think really fantastic leaders do listen and that was pointed out by, by all of you um that is more important than anything else making people feel supported and so um you know if you're not communicating enough anyone out there communicate as much as you possibly can because even when you think you've done enough communicating you probably need to communicate even more and listen even more because that in abundance um you know i think doing that can't you know you can't go too far wrong and certainly you can't have too much of listening love and communication so uh, thank you all very very much indeed um, you can catch up on demand on our site, www.darglobal.org. Uh, visit us if you would like to um, take part in a 30-day membership, which we're offering to everyone. Um, you can come back with any other specific questions for our panelists today. Please do get in touch with us and or get in touch directly, but do bear in mind, uh, everyone is very busy at the moment, so uh, it will, we'll do our best to come back to you if you're, you're reaching out to the guys directly. They are on LinkedIn, but I will put all of the links to all of the respective websites and businesses there so you can check out the specific advice or information and services that everyone is offering at this time and we will look forward to seeing you again very very soon my name is Leila mckenzie dallas and, and this uh, this panel dial global virtual lounge was was brought to you by www.dialglobal.org thanks again <laughs>